Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Your Excellency, Mr. Sucipto MPDBI PhD as the Head of English Education Study Program, the Honorable Mam Hayansi PhD as our International Guest Lecturer, the Honorable Mr. Subando MA as today's moderator, the Honorable all of the lecturers of English Education Study Program, and unforgettable all of the participants of today's webinar. All praise be to Allah, the Lord of the world, the King of the King, who makes all everything in this universe, who has given us blessings and mercies so that we can join this webinar section. And don't forget, praying and greeting we send to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who has brought us from the darkness to the path of the light. My name is Sanatul Adma Asmuni, a space master of ceremony, and I would like to say welcome to International Guest Lecture with the theme Lusun's Perspective of Translation, Theory, and Practice. Before going to our agenda today, let me read the today's agendas. The first agenda is opening, second is an agenda, the third is Q&A section, fourth is documentation section, and the fifth is closing. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first agenda is opening. Let's open our agenda today by reciting Basmalah together. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The second agenda is what we are waiting for, the explanation from our guest lecturer, Mam Hayansi, PhD. But before that, let me introduce our moderator for today's webinar to you. He is Mr. Subando, one of the alumnus of English Education Study Program of Universitas Ahmad Dahlan. He is a Master in Linguistic in Gajah Mada University and currently pursuing a doctoral degree program in Applied Linguistics at Pasmani University in Hungary. To Mr. Subando, time is yours. Thank you very much for the MC. First of all, I would like to say good morning to all of you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the opportunity that today I will be moderating of this such wonderful event held by English Education Department of Ahmad Dahlan University where I was studied uh, in the past couple of years. And let me introduce myself. Please call me uh, Dedi or Doa. I am now working as a teacher staff in the Department of English Education at Universitas Muhammadiyah Metro Lampung. While now I'm doing my doctoral study at Pazman Peter Catholic University in Hungary with the Applied Linguistic Program. So I'm really thankful for uh, the team that has invited me to join and to be the moderator for this wonderful event. And then I'm delighted to welcome to you all to this prestigious international guest lecture held by the department English department of Ahmad Dahlan University on the topic of Luzon's perspective of translation, which will be talking about theories and practices. Today we have the distinct honor of hosting an eminent scholar and keynote speaker, Professor Hayan C as an associate professor in the department of English at the School of Foreign Languages, Central China Normal University. So here's, I'm going to read her CVs. Professor C was graduate from English Language and Literature in 2002 from English Department, Hubei University of Education in China. And then she continued studying translation in 2007 
from School of Foreign Languages, Central China Normal University in China. And then she became a visiting scholar in 2014, where it took in Central for Global Studies and Humanities, Duke University, USA. And then she has completely studied in doctoral study program focusing on comparative literature 2019 in the Department of Modern Languages and Cultural Studies, University of Alberta, Canada. She also has a wonderful experiences in teaching starting from 2011 until 2015 as an English instructor is in um, at the uh, Sejiang Shai Tech University in China. And then she has a, a wonderful activities as a research assistant in 2017 at the University of Alberta, Canada, as well as teaching assistant in the University of Alberta, Canada as well. In 2018, she became a principal instructor at the International Intermediate Chinese University, Alberta, Canada. And 2019, she became principal instructor at World Literature University of Alberta, Canada. And 2020, up to now, she is an instructor at the Central China Normal University Department of English. So for all the audiences here, I encourage you to actively participate in our today's talk discussions. If you have questions, please, please don't hesitate and engage in our meaningful dialogue. Let us take this opportunity to enrich our knowledge and deepen our appreciations for the art of translations. Once again, I extend a warm welcome to Professor Syed and all of you, our distinguished guest, as we embark on this enlightening journey into Lusun's perspective of trans perspective of translation, theory, and practice. Without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Sid to commence this international lecture. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Dua. I just want to make sure if you can hear me clearly. Yes, yes, I can uh, hear. Okay, that's great. Uh, first of all, I will share my screen. Uh, uh, excuse me, Professor uh, C. Uh, I would like to uh, say something about the presentations rule. So there will be a first break sessions during the sixty minutes. But don't worry, I will uh, I will be reminding you about these sessions. We will have a hundred and twenty minutes for all uh, the the talk. So so again, don't worry. I will remind about the time. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, good morning, my dear colleagues and students at the University of Ahmad uh, Dalam. Nice to meet, meet everyone of you here. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank good morning, the professor. English yeah. department. <laughs> good morning. Um, I would also like to thank the English education department to invite me to give this uh, lecture. It's really a great honor for me to share my ideas with my international students, uh, international friends here. And I would uh, really appreciate, also very appreciate Mr. Subandu's uh, generous introduction to me. Thank you very much. The world just, I will just uh, start with my talk, but Yes, I think I need to to share the screen first of all. Okay, here we go. Wait a second. Okay. Uh, so 
the topic of my talk is about Lu Xun's perspective of translation, which includes his uh, translation theory and translation practice. But specifically, I'm going to focus on, okay, I, I can't see the word here, so let's change a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to focus on the politics of untranslatability in Lu Xun's translation through an examination of his two iconic terms, grabism and half translation. So don't worry if you're very, if you are unfamiliar with these two terms, because both of them are coined terms by Lu Xun himself. Um, I think you have already got familiar with uh, Lu Xun, his life and career based on the material I provided several days ago. So here I will just give a very uh, brief introduction to Lu Xun before we move on to his translation practice and theory. So Lu Xun was born in 1881, that's the late Qing Dynasty, and he is universally regarded as the father of modern Chinese literature. And also the greatest Chinese writer in the 20th century, Chinese literature. Um, so if we talk about Lu Xun, whenever we talk about Lu Xun, uh, we would say it, to Chinese, he's just like William Shakespeare to the British people. And uh, pri probably, you know this person, right? Yes, I just checked this on the internet, but I'm not quite sure. I, I think maybe he's also, he's to Chinese, it's just like from, from Modia to the Indonesian readers, if I didn't make a mistake. Okay, okay. Uh, so some introduction about Lu Xun's literary works. He's best known for his short stories, including those very uh, uh, influential ones like Diary of a Madman and a Koiji, which is a name, a Chinese name, and especially the true story of RQ. Among many collections of his works, two of them are especially uh, particularly important. One is called Call to Arms, another one is Wandering. These two are often acclaimed as classics of modern Chinese literature. Besides writing stories, uh, Lu Xun also write poetry, prose, and literary histories. And he's also a very important critic, known for cultural criticism and polemical essays. Overall, Lu Xun played an important role in the development of modern Chinese literature. His books remain highly influential and popular today, both in China and internationally. Um, so here I would like to uh, to say that my aim of choosing Lu Xun as my today's talk is that I think he does not only belong to, to, to Chinese readers, actually all of his works is definitely, are definitely part of the world literature and he is also internationally relevant. Uh, and then for almost a century, Lu Xun has been discussed as a revolutionary, a philosopher, a thinker, and author, as we've already partly learned from Wang Hui's article titled Dead Fire, that Dead Fire, sorry, this is a mistake, a minor mistake. Dead Fire Rekindled, in which he says, Lu Xun is a figure of paradox and he's a paradoxical thinker too. So you might be, uh, you might have been curious that why I provide such an old article, which was written in 1996. It's just because this article was very representative in terms of discussing Lu Xun's thought, uh, intellectual thought. And also because of the writer Wang Hui, just a very brief introduction to him. He's currently a professor at the Tsinghua University, uh, one of the most prestigious universities in China. And he is often regarded as very influential intellectuals in contemporary China, uh, not only known in China, but also uh, internationally. And he has wrote and written a book called Resisting uh, Despair about Lu Xun, which is very well known, but this is written in Chinese. 
Mm, so I think this statement uh, was derived from that exact book. I will come to this statement later, but later, but at the end, at the end of my uh, talk. So, in fact, Lu Xun's literary career began and ended in translation, although he is universally known as a writer. As a prolific translator, he translated works of 100 writers from about 14 uh, different countries in a variety of genres. So here I just list uh, part of his translated works because I don't have enough space to show all of them. Lu Xun left to the world not only many essays of translational translational theories, such as those written by Nuna Ka, Nuna, uh, Nuna Kasky and other Russian Russian literary critics, but also literary translation works amounting to about five million words, which is almost equal to his to the word count of his entire literary a, a literary creation. So while his literary achievement have been extensively studied for decades, Lu Xun's translation have been too controversial to be sufficiently discussed. Uh, to be sufficiently discussed and evaluated. Much of the debate on the last century centered on the obscurity and intelligibility of Lu Xun's translation, particularly his controversial strategy of hard translation. It's true that many of Lu Xun's translations, if regarded from the perspective of the interlingual transfer, cannot be considered satisfactory, not even worthy of reading from readers' perspective due to their unreadability. Uh, this explains to some extent and the much less scholarship on his translation compared with that on his literature. Entering this century, scholars' attentions have largely shifted from translation from language per se to the ideolo ideology reasons behind his translation. This is also one part of my focus today, but I'm going to take an alternative perspective. I integrate Lu Xun's culture stance, culture proposals, or theory named gravism into my investigation of Lu Xun's translation and I attempt to disentangle the complicated relationship between Lu Xun's translation and his theory of gravism so as to reinterpret him as a translator. I treat Lu Xun's translation practice and the translated works as a self contained system which is dynamic and constantly evolving. It's a simultaneous, uh, simultaneously rooted in the Chinese intellectual discourse of national salvation and other entangled motivation of Lu Xun himself. So the, the, the following questions are what I'm going to explore in my talk today. Uh, first one, how do the two different aspects of untranslatability embodied in a discourse of Lu Xun's translation interact with his idea of gravism. Second, how does the paradox of Lu Xun's translation practice provide insight into his position as a translation? And number three, how is Lu Xun's translation thought and practice relevant to today's cultural exploitations against the backdrop of this globalized world? <laughs> Um, I will first of all start with uh, this coined phrase, grabism, and its implications for Lu Xun's translation. Lu Xun coined the term grabism as a proposed uh, cultural strategy to learn from the West against the background of Sandism and the national essentialism in the early 20th century. The term grabism first appeared in the essay of the same title published in 1933, but he didn't offer, uh, offer an explicit definition of what grabism really is, thus leaving it open to multiple interpretations while simultaneously obscuring it. Rather than directly define uh, grabism, Lu Xun denounced 
the phenomenon of Zenism by ironically commenting. China has been practicing a policy of closed doorism. It never goes out, nor are the others allowed to come in. However, since the door was broken through by fire alarms, everything in China is starting to be sent away. I just want to advocate that we can be a little bit stingier in addition to sending, we must also take. That is, that is takeism or grabism. Sometimes we just use these two words uh, interchangeably. Among many interpretations of this statement, uh, one made by an established professor of comparative literature based at University of California, Shu Mei here, this is her, her name, was uh, standing out and frequently quoted uh, by many scholars. She says, by grabism, it means borrowing from other countries with confidence, like a master who chooses, who chooses freely according to his needs and not like a neurotic who feels the loss of indigenous, indigenous tradition or enslavement by what is borrowed. However, I would like to negotiate such a universal understanding of grabism. The idea of grabism can be traced back to late Qing attempts to deal with Western incursions into China, in particular, the idea of Chinese learning as the principles and Western learning as the application that's in Chinese, zhong ti xi yong. First proposed by uh, this person, Zhang Zhidong, in late Qing Dynasty, provided an obvious model for instrumentalist appro appropriation of Western knowledge. Zhang Zhidong was one of the four famous officials of the late Qing Dynasty, and he's very known for advocating controlled reform and modernization of Chinese troops. The idea of a Chinese learning as the principles and a Western learning as the application became a popular slogan used in the late Qing reforms. It's a move of merging Western science and technology with Chinese traditional values, intended to strengthen China according to the assumption that Chinese cultural traditions could serve as the foundation for the application of the Western learning. However, Lu Xun's grab is, is greatly different from this idea because Lu Xun declares a complete break from Chinese tradition in favor of borrowing cultural elements from the West. Although the notion of grabism was proposed late uh, in his late years, it represented a continuation of Lu Xun's cultural position, implicitly reflecting his ambival ambivalent attitude towards Western modality. Among his uh, contemporaries, Lu Xun was seen as a radical iconoclast who called for the complete destruction, destruction of Chinese traditional values and who fervently promoted new ideas from the West. However, unlike some of his peers who advocates reforming the political system, Lu Xun believed that China's real problem was not primarily institu uh, inst institutional, but culture. He lamented that the Chinese people have been enslaved by the cannibalistic culture of the old society for long, resulting in Chinese national characteristic, a Chinese national characteristic that was marked by civility. Lu Xun believed the only way to eliminate this mindset of civility was to overhaul Chinese traditional values. This belief becomes radical with dismissal of Chinese literature. This is really very interesting because simultaneously he is writing uh, those works. He is doing the creative uh, writing. For example, he proposes to Chinese use of his time to read fewer or even not to read Chinese books. This certainly attracts much criticism and condemnation from not only his peers, but also uh, from some contemporary scholars. 
the reason for Lu Xun's opposition to Chinese culture uh, traditions have been long discussed in Chinese scholarship. Some of the established scholars of Persian studies cited his view of the civility of traditional Chinese culture as explanations for his opposition. But I would like to argue for a different, another possible reason, which may be found in the opinion of Lu Xun's peer, Hu Shi. A little bit introduction to Hu Shi here. He is a leading figure of the May 1st generation of Lu Xun's generation. Probably um, he is more influential in Lu Xun, especially as a politician. So Hu, Xun, uh, Hu Shi says, I advocate wholesale westernization, but at the same time, I point out that culture has its own inertia. Wholesale westernization will naturally result in a tendency towards compromise. The ancient set taking the top as our example. We attain only to the middle. Taking the middle as our example, we fall miserably low. This is a truth well worth thinking over. Okay, Hu Shi set the tone for the new cultural movement and also represented a majority of the intellectuals of the Mughal period, undoubtedly including Lu Xun. As most Chinese people accepted the idea of eclecticism as one of the defining traits of the Chinese mind, Hu Shi believed that cultural radicalism would not become a problem because it would probably be mediated within the Chinese context. Hu position, a perception of Chinese characteristics in some way echoes Lu Xun's view. In his essay, Silent China, Lu Xun claimed that if one suggested opening a window in a house, he should also suggest removing the roof so that others would compromise and allow him to open a window. In this sense, Lu Xun's so-called radical cultural stance can be understood as expediency and not necessarily as a long-term solution. Thus, by advocating that Chinese people read fewer or not even read Chinese books, Lu Xun simply expected to achieve a compromise similar to that outlined by Hu Shi. Uh, here, I have no intention to make any judgment as to whether Lu Xun entirely is entirely against the Chinese traditions or not, which is really a complicated issue that has been discussed as well in Chinese scholarship. However, Lu Xun's sentiments did most likely influence his choices over the course of the introduction of Western literature, Western culture to China. For example, Although most intellectuals of his time regarded the borrowed idea of democracy and the science as the most important prerequisites to the modernization of China, Lu Xun held rather complicated views of both. Although Western democracy might be a powerful weapon with which Chinese people could fight against imperialist powers and warlord regimes, he was concerned about the possibility of tyranny of the majority and criticized the irrational advocacy of Chinese of importing Western constitutional democracy into China without a prudent consideration of Chinese uh, reality. And he thinks that an overemphasis on science could lead to a harmful depart, uh, de dependence on materialism and a lack of human concern. Thus, although according to the concept of gravism, all that was good and useful for national salvation should be drawn on and absorbed, this sentiment by no means endorses the idea of, quote, borrowing from other countries with confidence, quote, and without, quote, fearing the loss of the indigenous tradition or enslavement by what is borrowed, quote, as the psychologist Shishu Mei thinks. Instead, what seemed incommensurable in the logic of gravism was that in the course of taking useful ideas from the West, the risk of self-colonization was always present. And the challenge was thus to despair 
the goals of coloniality embodied in the Western discourse. For Lu Xun, the solution is very simple. In one of his essays, he wrote, if one sees the opium, he does not publicly throw it into the cesspool to demonstrate his resolute determination of reform. Instead, he sends it to the drugstore so that it can be used to, to treat patients. Obviously, gravism provides a theoretical guidance for Lu Xun to establish a constructive manner of communicating with and learning from the West by sticking to the idea of taking whatever is useful from the West and selectively using what has been taken. Gradism was a compromise, compromise between the goal of national salvation and Lu Xun's reserved attitude towards Western modality. Uh, here, I would like to digress a little bit and clarify that by the term grabism, I do not uh, refer only to Lu Xun's essay of the same title or his ideas following the publication of that essay in 1934. Rather, I take it as an idea that, that was gradually formed and matured as a cultural theory throughout Lu Xun's life. Lu Xun most likely constantly adjusted the exact contents of gravism, though all revolving around the central theme of borrowing new ideas from the West to rejuvenate Chinese culture. And this was evident in his translation practices in different periods of time. Within the framework of gravism, translation as a powerful tool with which to undertake the task of taking everything useful from the West would confront the problem of incommensurability as well. In its paradox of simultaneously resisting Western hegemonic discourse and embracing Western modality. Thus, next, by providing a detailed investigation of Russian's translation, I intend uh, to discuss how Grabism shaped Lucian's concept of translation as a whole, and also how the idea of Grabism was developed and internalized in Lucian's translation, so that it allows him to reconcile his seemingly contradictory position of being both for and against the Western modality. Uh, before I move on, I would like to uh, briefly uh, clarify that by untranslatability, I actually mean uh, have to have two different meanings. I will discuss it from two different aspects. The first aspect refers to the undefinable or untranslatable nature of Lu Xun's translation in his early career. And, uh, and the different aspect is that untranslatability Untranslatability is taken as a political strategy related to Lu Xun's hard translation. I will move on with the first aspect. <clears throat> it's almost universally accepted in academia that the notion of translation is historically and culturally determined, which indicates that translation does not necessarily have a universal meaning. So the scholar uh, Ronit Risi says, the very word translation with the cultural connotations and the expectations it carries is untranslatable. So here by untranslatable, it is, it is undefinable. Under the guidance of his theory of gravism, which as it shows in my uh, subsequent analysis, carries the cultural connotations and expectations peculiar to him at different points in time. The nature of Lucian's translation, uh, of Lucian's translation contact is frequently destabilized. In fact, the notion of, of translation used in Lucian's context is far less clear if his early literary works and translations are taken into consideration. Uh, this can be seen in his translation of the article um, on the power of Mora poetry. 
I use the word translation here, but for some other scholars, they would use the word original creative writing. So here, here is a picture. This is um, the, the original text of Lu Xun's article on the power of Mora poetry. And this is a picture of Lu Xun here. But this article has been the subject of controversy over whether it's a translation or an original work. The article Mora discussed uh, various great national poets such as Byron, Shelley, Pushkin, Lamonto, and uh, Petofi. As part of various great national poets, um, they are, are taken as Lucian's purpose of seeking new voices from abroad and calling upon the warriors of the spirit among Chinese people. According to the Japanese scholar Kitako Masaki, his, uh, his study of the source material of uh, Murad, two of the essays, nine sections, I mean, Lushin's essay, of nine sections were taken from both uh, the Japanese scholar Kimura Takatara's Byron Great Saint of the Literary World, written in 1902, and his translation of Byron's the Kose with his foreword and annotations. In a former, Kimura eulogized Byron's spirit of resistance and expressed his praise for the powerful and the contempt of the weak. Lucien selectively used this material by retaining most of Kimura's ideas and discarding the idea of contempt of the weak. In the latter, he adopted the material concerning strong will and a revolt against oppression without mentioning Byron's ideas of hedonism and feminism. The remainder of the essay was compiled in the same manner with content that did not suit to the purpose of Murat absent from the text. So the article of Murat is thus an early example of Lu Xun's precise grabism influenced by his interest in nationalism and the grand nationalist discourse of his time. Most scholarship on Mora have treated as Lu Xun's original uh, creation rather than a translation, primarily due to its contribution to Chinese literary criticism and to the political ideology that, it, uh, that informs it. However, because the essay incorporates translations and adaptations, ad adaptations of foreign texts, the boundary between translation and original creation in Mara appears blurred, and the nature of the essay itself becomes ambiguous. It bears characteristics of both translation and original, but does not precisely fit into either category. To further add to the confusion, Lu Xun did not specif specify his sources, nor explain how he comp composed the essay. In short, Lu Xun may not have a clear idea of a translation in mind at the time. He was probably more concerned with making use of Western history and championing the revolutionary spirit of various Western poets to inculcate patriotism and the nationalism. Another case is Lu Xun's translation. I have to use the quotation mark here, translation of The Soul of Sparta, published on a magazine uh, called Zhejiang Tide. So this is the cover of the magazine with the Chinese character Zhejiang Tide in 1903. <clears throat> this article calls on the use of China to learn from the self-sacrificing spirit of the ancient Spartan resistance against the Persians. The article was published against the backdrop of Russian threat to take over Manchuria in northern China. Lu Xun created this story based on Japanese translation of Greek historical text. Uh, if Mara and Sp Sparta, I mean these two articles, are not quite representative of translated works, some of Lu Xun's earlier translations also challenge the definition of the term translation per se. During the 1900s, Lu Xun translated several works of science fiction 
including uh, these two ones. Uh, sorry, they are all the Chinese version. Uh, one is from the Earth to the Moon. Another one is um, Julie to the center of the Earth and others. With the aim of encouraging Chinese readers to study science, Lu Xun's translation strategies were primarily restri restricted to free translation and transcompilation, which means a compilation of compilation and translation. This move was probably influenced by the mainstream practices of translators in the late Qing dynasty. For example, uh, in Lu Xun's translation of From the Earth to the Moon, he uh, adopted a free translation method rearranging the 28 chapters of the original novel and uh, condensing them into 14 chapters by editing and cutting. Moreover, he changed the original chapter format into that of a traditional Chinese novel in Chinese recorded Zhang Huiti style. So here is a brief introduction, uh, explanation of Zhang Huiti. This is a type of traditional Chinese novel, a narrative structure comprised of sequential chapters or episodes, often with an overarching story connecting them. Uh, the Chinese classics Journey to the West and A Dream of the Red Chamber belongs to this, uh, are all um, adopted in this uh, Zhang Huiti style. <clears throat> So Lu Xun's early translation practice involved compilation, rewriting, and original creation, all for very clear didactic purpose. Given his ambiguous attitude towards the sources of his translation in Mura and Sparta, and his hegemonic strategy imposed on his science fiction translations, it's obvious that translation for Lu Xun is not always unified in nature or in purpose. In Mora and Sparta, Lucien apparently placed aesthetic and ideological purposes ahead of a semantic accuracy in order to inspire a fighting spirit in his readers. Although the core belief of this translation strategy did not change much in his translation of Western science fiction, he focused more on the stylistic features of the target text at the expense of the source ta text structure in an attempt to make the stories and the science be behind them attractive to Chinese readers. The ambiguous nature of Lu Xun's translation was further complicated by a number of shifts in his later years. Comparing his early translations with those produced since 1909, we can see a clear rupture in his a perception of translation, particularly with regard to subject matter, translation strategy, and translation language. Some of the trends in his later works seemed almost to negate his early work, such as his shift from science fiction to pro-humanist anti-war works, from transcompilation and free translation to hard translation, and from classical Chinese to vernacular Chinese. To understand why Lu Xun changed his translation strategies completely, it's necessary to contextualize him in the intellectual politics of the beginning of the 20th century, particularly since around the Chinese Revolution of 1911, which marks the overthrowing of the Qing Dynasty. Lu Xun realized that even the fall of the Qing, dynast Qing Dynasty, that is the imperial system, did not actually changed China's cannibalistic culture. His pessimistic view of Chinese traditional culture and its people were manifested in many of his short stories he wrote in the years after the revolution, such as the well-known Diamond uh, Diary of a Madman, Kong Yiji, or the true story of Aqi. As he ultimately identified Chinese national character as the fundamental course of China's quote unquote, disease. His devotion to transforming this national character extended from his literary works to the direct importation of Western literature that could promote a humanitarian spirit 
whole spirit of resistance against hegemony. At this point, Lu Xun's translation in both method and the subject matter became part of a long-term strategy to transform the Chinese national character, which according to him is characterized by civility. Lu Xun's primary criterion for the choice of original text was subject matter. He prioritized texts that promoted humanitarian and anti-war ideals and a resistance against hegemony. Thus, where other translators introduced greater writings in the mainstream works from the West to the Chinese reading public, Lu Xun denied the authority of Western literature by ignoring Western literary canons. This can be understood by remembering that in terms of the West, Lu Xun did not necessarily mean the most powerful Western countries, but rather the West in a broadened sense. The source texts he selected were mainly from Japan and Eastern European countries such as Russia, Poland, Hungary, and Bulgaria because many small, smaller European nations were being overrun by greater powers, as was China at its time. These countries were producing literary works that focused on themes such as self-reliance, independence, and resistance. These qualities depicted in Western literature formed a stark contrast to what Lu Xun regarded as the slavish mentality of Chinese culture in Chinese literature. He therefore hoped that the struggle of literary heroes against oppression by powerful forces would serve as an inspiration to the Chinese reading public. <clears throat> so instead of intentionally giving priority to canonical writers in the West, Lu Xun was more interested in works that would fulfill his political goals of positively influencing Chinese readers and transforming Chinese society. Even if those works and the authors were not well known in their own countries, as was the case with the blind Russian uh, writer, Aroshenko. So from this first picture, we can say this is um, Lu Xun and Aroshenko is sitting beside him. Lu Xun translated many of Arishenko's works, including the collection of Arishenko's fairy tales and the children's play, Peach Colored Cloud. So these are his translated works. Arishenko's work often criticizes civility and yearn for a more peaceful world that affirms the essential goodness of human nature, which happens to coincide with Lu Xun's idea that the Chinese masses often lack such awareness. The characters depicted in Aroshenko's tales similarly resonate with Lu Xun. For instance, in the story, the narrow cage collected in this uh, collection, a tiger tries to rescue small animals and people trapped in various cages only to find out that they have been kept in the cages for so long that they have lost their ability to survive outside the cages and were no longer willing to leave. In translating words such as this, Lu Xun in his own words aims to arouse hatred and anger towards hegemony among people and did not mean to stretch out hand into the so-called palace of arts to pluck exotic flowers and rare herbs from abroad and transplant them to China. This remarks may give the impression that Lu Xun valued the, the, the cultural and the political functions of literature far more than its aesthetic function. However, when considering the historical context, the national salvation overrides everything else, it's a lot difficult to understand why Lu Xun highlights the didactic function of literature in his translation. In general, Lu Xun's standards for selecting source texts may have fallen out of favor today, but in the context of his time, those standards were significant. His translation practice unified his seemingly incompatible goals of appropriating Western literature to educate Chinese readers and resisting Western 
hegemonic discourse. If I examine Lucian's translation practice from a Western theoretical perspective, as many Chinese scholars actually did, we would find something very interesting here. As everyone in translation studies knows that Lawrence Vanuti proposes a method of foreignizing strategy, a uh, foreign, uh, foreignizing translation. And he denounces that foreign literatures tend to be dehistoricized by the selection of texts for translation, removed from the foreign literary traditions while they draw their significance. According to this practice, the violence of translation that resides in its very purpose and activity, Vanuti condemns the uh, hegemony of target culture that dominates the periphery culture through its manipulation of translation. Although Lushin's source texts are from comparatively powerless countries and nations in the West, China's more peripheral position in the Western discourse of the time still makes it vulnerable to Western influence. So Lushin's process of translation may run a reversed risk of subsuming Chinese culture in its Western counterparts. As a result, Lushin's manipulation of translation, such as his intentional selection of the text, writers and the subject matters as factors of dehistoricizing the foreign literatures, tend out to be a comparatively effective resistance to the hegemony of the Western discourse as a whole. Uh, here comes a brief conclusion for this part. All these shifts and the seeming inconsistencies in Lucian's translation revolve around the core of his rabbism. That is the purpose of maximizing the instrumental function of translation toward China's national salvation project. The untranslatable nature of his translation as a whole reflects the instability and the evolution of grabism, even as the national salvation effort remains unchanged. Uh, next, I will examine a different aspect of untranslatability and investigate how the idea of grabism has brutally interfered with linguistic and cultural untranslatability through hard translation. Uh, I will also look into uh, Lucien's belief of a face place rather than fluency in translation and how this has evolved into a complete hard translation in his later uh, translation career. Uh, first of all, a little bit about hard translation. Um, I assume you have read the article I provided the other days about the translation of Lushin as a Promethean uh, translator, because the article uh, really deals with the term hard translation, which is coined by Lushin himself. Generally speaking, hard translation means an, a rigid literal word for word translation. But what is uh, like. So I just uh, conveniently uh, cite a passage from that article, which was actually written by Lu Xun's peer, Liang Shixiu, another leading figure in his time. Uh, in the article on uh, Mr. Lu Xun's translation, someone condemned Lu Xun, Lu Xun not only closely followed the order of words and sentences in the originals, but also insisted on not adding a single word or moving a single one forward or backward. Such a translation is only a translation in name because the work in fact remained un untranslated. Even Zhou Zuoren, who is uh, Lu Xun's brother, a supporter of literal translation condemns it as that translation. Uh, so I think maybe uh, it's a little bit difficult for you to, to, to understand this because if we assume the, the, the transfer between languages within the same family, it would be okay if the translator just uh, insists on not adding a single word or moving a single one forward or backward. For example, from we translate work from German to English, uh, 
But this is totally a different story if we translate a language from uh, the Indo-European language system to um, sino tibetan language system as Chinese. So here, Mishun Spear Liang Shiqiu used a word to condemn his translation as that translation, which I think you know the meaning. And the polemics between Liang Shiqiu and Lu Xun over Lu Xun's hard translation has gone on for eight years. Okay, this is really very interesting about the discussions, debate, heated debate between them. Uh, this is the general idea we, we got about uh, how Lu Xun's hard translation looks like. In his later translation career, Lu Xun labeled his translation method hard translation uh, but he explained in a quite different uh, way from what we uh, get from that quotation. So Lu Xun says, any translation should take both aspects into consideration. On the one hand, it should be an, as easy as to understand as possible. On the other, the charm of the original text must be preserved to the largest extent. In other words, any translation should be both explicit and expressive. However, the preservation of the original charm is often co contradictory to the principle of being easy to understand because the target readers are not accused, accustomed to the exotic style of the original text. In order to make the target text read more smoothly, a translator has to make some adjustment. But this does not mean that the translator should conduct plastic surgery on the original text, which I am entirely against. Thus, to achieve official loss, it's worthwhile to surrender the fluency of the target text. We would think this is quite uh, normal for a translator to have this uh, thought. Actually, I think of a lot, a lot of translators just held the same idea as Lu Xun, um, literally. See, in this statement, Lu Xun particularly underlies the idea of faithfulness rather than fluency when talking about the issue concerning untranslatability, although he didn't use the word, the exact word here. According to him, if explicitness and expressiveness are not achievable, the translator should give priority to faithfulness at, at the expense of readability of the target text. This uh, statement, um, in other words, the phrase, I mean, the um, faithfulness rather than fluency, this uh, phrase can be read as an alternative expression of hard translation. It indicates that Lu Xun may not necessarily have regarded hard translation as a perfect strategy, but it was probably most desirable method of dealing with untranslatable elements. These remarks have long been taken by scholars as something authoritatively, uh, authoritative to represent Lu Xun's translation thought. However, we will see shortly from an um, example I'm going to provide uh, whether Lu Xun did what he said or said what he did. In Wampu's article I provided uh, the other days entitled The Promethean Translator and the Categoristic Pains, he discussed the hard translation by focusing on Lu Xun's translation of literary theories. In fact, the discussion of Lu Xun's hard translation commonly starts with his translation of literary theories or criticism and ends with his political appeal for a better understanding of the real uh, proletarian literature, which highlights his contribution to the revolution as a leftist writer or translator. Well, I quite agree with this idea or argument. I think things may turn out different if we take a different research perspective. Therefore, uh, instead of focusing on his translation of literary theories, I would like to uh, continue to look at his translation of literary works again to see if it's a different story. 
Uh, this is an excerpt taken from a Russian author's novella called Worker Shepherd, translated from Russian to German, and then was translated into Chinese by Lu Xun. I guess most of you just um, do not speak German. Okay, so anyway, given German and English belong to the same language family, so I, I have roughly transferred the text from German into English so that we can have a rough idea about the stylistic, the content and the stylistic feature of the text. So let's just come to the English version. From the English text, you can observe whether the passage is hard to understand or not, and whether the style is unrealistic, and whether there are many professional expressions that probably, but that probably do not have equivalent expressions in the target language, and so on. The story of uh, worker chef, chef Ray centers around the debate over whether a revolution should be violent or not. This excerpt depicted the protagonist, uh, Chef Ray's living environment through the eyes of a new talent. As you may say, the text is not a theoretical or with ornamental language. Even one who does not have a good command of English can understand the text without many efforts. But what about Lu Xun's translation? Uh, I just want to describe to you that whenever I show the Chinese version to my Chinese student, I would always see the jaw dropping look and then over enjoyment on their face because they think they can definitely do better than Lu Xun. I do have a Chinese version here, but I, I don't think any one here understand Chinese, so we'll just uh, I ignore it and turn back to the English version. But I apologize that I, I can't offer a detailed text analysis considering the target language is Chinese, but briefly speaking, in the target text, Lu Xun left the original order of the syntactic elements untouched. In German, as in English, several adjectives can be juxtaposed before a noun, and a long sentence can consist of one or more clauses. But these syntactic forms are uncommon in China, in, in Chinese. Instead, modifiers usually appear as phrases or clauses rather than as a string of adjectives, which would sound awkward and weird in Chinese. Also, the common practice of translating long or complicated sentences from English into Chinese is to break the sentence into several small sentences. But Lu Xun kept the long sentence intact in and placed the long modifiers before the noun, even without before the noun, even without changing the order of the modifiers. Therefore, the literal text, I mean the target text, reads like an obscure theoretical text. Notably, what lies in his pro problematic translation is not an issue of untranslatability. Or I may say, a lot that Lu Xun was not able to provide a more readable translation, but that he deliberately ignored Chinese syntax by implanting a Western syntactic structure into the target text. That makes his translation unreadable and unintelligible. In addition to his syntactic choices, Lu Xun also intentionally maintained exotic cultural elements. For example, in order to retain the foreignness of the Russian term uh, samovar, which refers to a Russian metal utensil for making tea, Lu Xun used transliteration rather than re replacing it as a close equivalent or something that has the same function in Chinese culture. He did use a footnote, which however, still cannot accommodate Chinese imagination of what some of one is. Lu Xun admits in his po a postscript to the translation of the work that apart from some places in the text, well, I have been forced to do otherwise, I have translated this word for word. Looking behind these remarks, 
as his intention that is more explicitly manifested in the paradoxes of his little theory translation, in which he says, due to my incompetence and the inherent weakness of Chinese language, when I read my translation, I feel it's obscure. Some sentences even difficult to understand. However, if I break the clause into several small sentences, I'm afraid the forceful tone of the original text will disappear in the target text. Therefore, to me, there is no way out except for hard translation. My last hope is that readers are willing to try hard to keep reading. This uh, remarks suggests that for Lu Xun, the weakness of the Chinese language an important reason along Side that of the translator's quote unquote incompetence for the untranslatability of the original sentence structure. As there seems no better way of precisely expressing the original text meaning in the target language, Lu Xun appeared to have involuntarily resorted to hard translation. However, paradoxically, rather than considering the differences between the language and the culture of the source and target text, he underscored the impreciseness of Chinese vocabulary and argued somewhere else that the lack of precision in our language proves the lack of precision in our way of thinking. We are model headed. As a result, he endeavored to put some heterogeneous syntax into the target text so as to cure the illness of the Chinese language and the Chinese thought pattern along with it. What lies behind this logic, however, is an imperceptible ideological manipulation embedded in the discourse of untranslatability, which goes far beyond the political revolution as many scholars argued. Deliberately downgrading the Chinese language, Lu Xun aimed to clear the obstacle of reforming Chinese by introducing new grammar and vocabulary from Western languages through translation. Hence, hence his reason for using hard translation was not to seek equivalent inter interlingual transfers between Western language and the Chinese at all. Thus, for Lu Xun, the claim of untranslatability went far beyond the linguistic scope. scope. And also, the hard translation of Marxist literary theories only account for a small part of his move of Brabism. The phenomenon of untranslatability, whether or not in a real sense or in an intentional sense, provides a different perspective for Lu Xun to implement his cultural theory of Brabism. In a discourse of translation and to possibly transforming Chinese language and the culture. In other words, Lu Xun intentionally treats Chinese culture and its Western counterpart as two isolated particularities, as a manifestation of their incompatibility and translatability facilitates his intention of replacing one with the other. The readily, he readily takes it as a cultural expedition though this process is sometimes interrupted by his uh, instinctive resistance to the, for the reasons discussed previously. Therefore, therefore Lu Xun's choice of translation is essentially a choice of culture under the guidance of Buddhism. This, to some extent, is in accordance with Amini Aptis' notion of the politics of untranslatability, although only um, uh, her starting point is different from that of Lu Xun, citing Gerard Cuff's observation that what cannot be expressed in any human language lies outside the boundary of translation and outside the field of language too. And to highlight the political implica uh, implications of the dialect of translatability and untranslatability. Similarly, for Lu Xun, the concept of the untranslatable represented a rich side for political inquiry rather than merely a technical problem to overcome. In his translations of both literary theory and uh, literature, Lu Xun deliberately left the original linguistic 
cultural and grammatical characteristics untranslated or untranslatable, which results in a universally recognized unreadability. I would like to remind Thus, that we are reaching for the first session's break. So if you have final remarks, then you can uh, say it now. Or we can we can we can continue after the break. What do you think, Professor? Okay. Yeah, 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 sure. Let's have a break. <laughs> we'll continue. Right. I actually I didn't leave much to say. Okay. Mm, thank you. <clears throat> Right, so for everybody here that are still listening to this uh, wonderful explanations from Professor C, and in the, with in the chat box, um, if we could see Professor, um, the one notification asking about whether the word samovar in the example translated into Chinese. So yeah, maybe this is a, the clarifications from, from the professor. She went providing as the example of the German's translation into English and Chinese, if I'm not mistaken um, with, with these questions. Uh, Do you want to respond? Uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry, would you please, uh, sorry, would you please just say it again? So oh, you okay. are asking about the translation from German to to Chinese? Uh, now I'm reading the, 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 the notifications from the chat box. If you could also open the chat box, so there will be one notification oh, yeah. mentioning that oh, yes. word samovar in the example translated into Chinese. Is that right? The word samovar in the example translated into Chinese. No, uh, that was 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 not actually translated into Chinese. It's a uh, uh, it's so we we can just uh, um know learn the sound of that word. That's transliteration. It's not it's not actually translation. So it's just it's just the same. A uh, strategy of translating uh, English names into Chinese. We actually just try to um, to make it sound the English pronunciation of the name, but we actually don't know the meaning of the English word. Yeah, this uh, this is not actually translated into Chinese. Okay. But he he did add a, a footnote there yeah, to to explain that this is. Uh, uh, utensil used to cook, uh, to to cook tea. Yeah, he just uh, explained this in his footnote without an uh, exact translation into Chinese. Yeah, I hope I make it clear. Thank you very much for the response. So everybody, let's if you have uh, another um, ideas, I don't know something that it is uh, unclear. Coming from the explanation, so please, please, please uh, use. You can use the type box uh, to write down your ideas. We can now. We are having a uh, first break, so if you have a con, I, I don't know if you have if you if you do not understand the concept about the Lucian's translations theory, so please do not hesitate to write down the questions as well before uh, we are heading to listen to the next talk from Professor C. continue the materials. Let us see whether the audience are still here. <laughs> During the next uh, one minute, we will have uh, another talk. Uh, we will have a continued talk from Professor C. So please, if you have any questions as well, you can write it down in the chat box. So now we are going to listen again from the Professor C in explaining the Lucian's perspective, theory, theory perspective, translations perspective. So, okay, so um, and I will continue, right? 
get rid of as I can. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so this is uh, a, a little bit a conclusion about untranslatability in the sense of Luxin's translation. I conclude here that untranslatability in Luxin's context should be understood as something that he intentionally does not translate rather than something that he cannot uh, translate. It serves as a justifiable excuse for Luxun to implement his strategy of hard translation in order to harvest the original vocabulary, knowledge, and ideas from Western literature. Um, actually, and now I'm going to uh, move to my conclusion is also the reflections, my reflections on Luxun's translation. That's not okay. <clears throat> Resolution with Wang Hui's claim at the very beginning of my talk that Lu Xun is a paradox and he's a paradoxical thinker too. I would like to add that Lu Xun is a paradoxical translator too. Wang Hui notes, notes that the profundity of Lu Xun resides in a fact that he represents the ideal of his time. But in the meantime, he expresses his ambiguity over his ideal. This conflict in Luxin's thought can be viewed as deeply rooted in his gra uh, grappling with the tension between his fervent embracing the need for, so for societal and cultural uh, uh, renewal and unconsciously resisting Western modality. Similarly, paradox informs his entire career of translation. Luxin refashioned translation into a means of simultaneously deconstructing and reconstructing Chinese culture based on his idea of gravism. The formulation of which is simply based on his perception of an urgent need for national salvation, but also on the long term of reforming Chinese character, national character. It was developed from a difficult journey of recurrent self-affirmation and self-negation about how best to grab and how to deal with what has been grabbed until it was finally established and epitomized in his iconic method of hard translation. Overall, Lucian's legacy as a paradoxical translator is rooted in a duality and the contradictions present in the untranslatable nature of his translation, as well as his incessantly rectified approaches to translating English literature into Chinese. While his translation was instrumental in introducing Western literary works to Chinese readers, his methods and perspectives on translation showcased a paradoxical interplay of various elements, as I uh, discussed previously. The significance of recognizing the paradox and the politics of the paradox in right residing in Luxin's translation practice and his cultural proposal of grabism reaches far beyond the reflections on the politics of Luxin's translation per se. It offers certain dynamics that are relevant to today's cultural exploitation around the world and prompts our reflections on contemporary translators engagement in cultural exploitation and importation against the backdrop of globalization and a call on the diversity of world uh, culture and the literature. <clears throat> uh, so here uh, goes some of my brief uh, thoughts. <clears throat> the contemporary relevance of Luxin's translation. Uh, firstly, cultural authenticity versus uh, global accessibility. In today's globalized world, successful cultural exportations and importations involve a similar interplay between global engagement and the preservation of local identity. In other words, balancing authenticity with accessibility is a constant challenge. 
we always confronted with the questions such as how to navigate the balance between preserving our own cultural authenticity and achieving optimal accessibility to international readers while engaging with global influences. And how cultural products can be presented in a way that resonate both locally and internationally. But more specifically, I would, uh, although <clears throat> I uh, do like uh, Lawrence Venuti's idea of foreignization, but I think it's really, uh, it's a lot, maybe it's a lot a good idea to just, just juxtapose the foreignization with domestication because. Uh, what I've learned from Lu Xun's spirit and Lu Xun's way of translation is that we can't treat everything static. Okay. And the second is individualism versus social responsibility. Cultural exportations and importations inevitably grapple with, uh, grapple with pres presenting individual voices while addressing broader so societal concerns. But there is a conflict between the two, which undoubtedly informs Lu Xun's entire career of translation. Can cultural products, uh, specifically translation, translate, translated works, specifically the translated works, carry both personal narratives and reflections on collective responsibilities? And the third, a cultural reflections versus transformation. Lu Xun selectively chose to translate those words that can serve as a response to the societal, so, social and the political crisis of his time and a call for tra cultural tra transformation. Today, cultural exploitation can be a tool for reflecting on contemporary issues and fostering positive change. Lu Xun's paradoxical stance on, on cultural critique and transformation can be a source of inspiration for cultural products that prompt reflections and the dialogue. In a large share, Lucian's translations were more than linguistic endeavors. They were vehicles for translation critique, literary as experimentation, and ideological expression. The paradoxical ca characteristics of Lucian's translation shed lights on our navigating the complexities of cultural exploitation among different countries. They emphasize the need for a balanced and a nuanced approach that respects cultural authenticity, engages with global dynamics, encourages critical reflection, and addresses both individual and societal dimensions. Hopefully, applying these insights can contribute to the success and the meaningful impact of cultural exploitation efforts in the contemporary world. Uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to welcome your questions and the discussions and the comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor C.S., for this wonderful explanations about the Lucian's translations theory uh, from the from the perspective of theory and practices. So. I welcome to all of you who has a questions. Please, please don't hesitate to raise your hand in the sessions. So there's a, let's see whether we have a question in the chat box. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I like this question, very interesting. So I was just wondering about the equivalence of Samovar in Chinese because it's maintained from the original into English. Uh, okay, so actually I have the same concern with you. I was also wondering, what is it? Because we don't have an equivalent in Chinese. We don't have this kind of things. Uh, even in uh, the, uh, the, um, the United States, even then in America, in, in Canada, I asked some of my colleagues and friends, and they even didn't know what is it. I think we should go to ask a Russian per people. <laughs> they might know it. This is quite local. Yeah, it's very quite local. We don't know what is it, but I guess it's, anyway, it's just a container. Uh, 
a boiler, as you say, to 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 cook tea. Yeah, that's it. But this is totally different from our Chinese. Uh, yeah, the stuff in Chinese, we we don't have equivalents. Sorry for this. Yeah, we just have different imaginations of what is it. I hope I um, answered your question. Okay, so responding the questions, is it possible to employ the Lucian's theory in grab uh, the cultural strategy in translating? I don't know whether it is untranslatable untranslatability into the the local language or the target language, Professor. Uh, responding to the questions, I mean. Uh, you mean this question? Yeah, 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 yeah. This the translation of the of, of this one. Um, <clears throat> oh, it's um. The first of all, I have to explain. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to make it sure. What do you mean by cultural theory here? Do you specifically refer to the cultural theory proposed by Lu Xun, the idea of gravism? Do you mean this? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um. This is uh, actually uh, quite influential. Yeah, we actually, this is only a word. This is uh, derived from one of his solutions article, but we regard it as a uh, cultural theories just because it's kind of systematically uh, proposed by Lu Xun. And so uh, consistently proposed by Lu Xun. Uh, first of all, I would like to to say something about this cultural theory of gravism in in China, I think it's so embedded in our uh, culture. Yes, for not only just in terms of translation, but for many other things. Uh, for example, we now have uh, since nineteen nineties we have the open up policy. I think this is really a very implementation of Lucian's cultural theory. But in terms of translation, um, I think this is a dialectic. Yes. Uh, for example, when we do translation from Chinese into uh, English or from English into Chinese, we always talk about the strategy of domestication and foreignization. Yes. And I would say that from the perspective of uh, Lawrence Van Lutte, we would think um, foreignization. Yes, many scholars just uh, equalize the foreignization with Lucien's uh, grabism, with Lucien's uh, method of translation. But to me, I would think this really depends. So sometimes we use foreignization, sometimes we use domestication, but it uh, depends. But both of them can be regarded as a way of grabbing uh, the Western knowledge and the culture uh, yeah, from the Western text into, into Chinese. So I think this is the essence of Lu Xun's cultural theory. He does not really uh, say that we should do this or we should do, do that. It depends um, on the different circumstances, especially the historical background. In contemporary China, in today's China, when we were trying to uh, exporting Chinese culture into the Western country. Uh, this is a lot of gravism. Uh, it's more um, sandism, yes, uh, you know, not in a positive sense, of course, yes. But uh, anyway, I just want to say this is uh, dialectic. We don't have a fixed understanding of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay. Let's see whether we have another question. Um, okay, Mr. Subandrawo. Uh, yeah. Please try. Please, please okay. just say. Okay, thank you. What a incredible perspective. Uh, Professor C, I just uh, want to confirm uh, some points. Uh, first, uh, Lusun's uh, thought seems to be uh, provoking, yeah, 
and influential theories yeah, on uh, literature and society at first. And you explained he explored much of uh, societal change and then culture conflict and the struggle for self-realization in his works. And on, on the other hand, he uh, tried to resist a Western hegemony. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, you are correct. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. And then uh, from that situation, how, how did Lucian address uh, the issue of uh, this cultural uh, differences in translation okay that's the first and the second one uh, you also mentioned that uh, Lucian I know uh, the, the Chinese uh, syntactic system and uh, he preferred uh, using Western syntactic uh, structure. Mm. Okay. And then in terms of uh, the untranslatability, then isn't it uh, a bit uh, tricky since a uh, potential distortion of uh, the intended message of the author might be existed? Um, how, how how to bridge how to bridge uh, this uh, linguistic uh, and cultural gaps because um uh, in terms of uh, untranslatability uh i think uh what lucian's uh, perspective yeah to honor uh, the chinese uh, syntactic system yeah. i think uh, in terms of the untranslatability it's um a bit uh, tricky. What do you think? Yes, yes. Uh, that's the point. I mean, I so I'll first uh, answer your response to your second question. So I I don't think this is a very tricky issue when we talk about the untranslatability. So this is also the reason why I refer to Emily Aptis, uh, his, uh, her monologue about the politics of untranslatability. So, you know, I would definitely think that the translatability and the untranslatability are not a binary. Yeah, it's uh, it's just a, a switch of um, strategies, not only for Lu Xun, but probably for many, uh, many translators. But in... Uh, in speaking of the distortion in translation, because uh, machines, because of this untranslatability, I think this is a great issue. That's why uh, we Chinese readers do not really like reading Lucian's uh, translation because we couldn't understand it. That means he, he can't really uh, express what the the original or uh, what the authors originally expressed in the, in the text. So from the interlingual transfer, from this perspective, his translation, uh, most of his translation works may be uh, um, invalid, a lot of readable, let alone saying that uh, it's a, a problem of untranslatability. It really, it does not actually have something to do with the issue of untranslatability. 